Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us today for our discussion panel um, called Digital Archaeology for a Virtual World. Uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Sabrina Higgins, and I'm the Vice President for Societies for the Archaeological Institute of America. And it's my pleasure today to have many of you here um, for an exciting discussion panel that was born out of uh, the Societies Committee, which oversees all of the local societies for the AIA. Um, this was an idea uh, born by one of our members, um, Melissa Morrison, who thought uh, it was it'd be a great idea to talk about all of the digital scholarship that's taking place right now as we move online and to think about ways in which local societies in particular can benefit from the types of new, interesting and cutting edge scholarship that is taking place online. Um, this event is part of a day long event. Um, hopefully you've been to others this morning. Um, we had our society brunch for society officers this morning, as well as uh, a lecture by Professor Salima Ikram. Now our discussion panel and after this we invite all of the society officers to our virtual happy hour, uh, the link to which is found in an email this morning, the same one you got uh, for your brunch. So the Societies Committee has been really hard at work this year to bring exciting programming to our members and this new virtual format has given us ways and ideas to make archaeology much more accessible to wider audiences and this is something we hope to continue in the future and I think today's panel is a perfect reflection of that um, and since I um, am just here to introduce it I would like to hand today's um, panel over to our moderator. Um, but first, I will just remind you that if you're not already an AIA member, please do so um, by joining the AIA. If you become a new member, you can get a calendar. And if you're a renewing member, uh, you can receive the Uncovering Pelos pamphlet. And if you're interested in supporting the work of societies and supporting more events like this uh, throughout the coming year, feel free to donate to uh, archaeological.org slash supporting societies. And of course, become um, if you become a member and you register uh, for the annual meeting, which starts this week, um, you will get discounted membership to the annual meeting where you can hear all kinds of um, talks like the one that we're about to hear today. So I'm going to pass it over to my colleague on the Societies Committee, Dr. Carolyn Laferriere, to get things started. Um, um, and let me just introduce her briefly. So Dr. Carolyn Laferriere is currently a postdoctoral scholar with the Center for Pre-Modern Pre -modern World at the University of Southern California. She was previously a postdoctoral associate with Archaea, uh, Yale University Program for Interdisciplinary Studies, uh, as well as a lecture, lecture department of history of art and classics at Yale. And she earned her PhD from Yale in uh, 2017. And she's also a member of one of the projects uh, that we'll be talking today, Peopling the Past. So she's the perfect uh, individual to sort of lead us through this discussion. And just a reminder that this program is being recorded. Um, and so any presentation or any um, recording of this live presentation uh, is strictly prohibited under intellectual property rights. And with that, I pass over to Dr. Carolyn Laferrier. Well, thank you, Sabrina, for that really kind introduction. I don't know that I'm the perfect person to moderate this panel, but um, I suppose as a member of one of the three projects that uh, we'll be hearing from today, uh, I guess I have a, a vested interest <laughs> in uh, the topic anyways that, that we're focusing on. Um, I would really like to just thank everyone for joining us today on Society Sunday. We're really delighted, um, you know, speaking on behalf of the Societies Committee, we're delighted to welcome you um, both to the entire day's worth of uh, events, but also especially to this discussion panel. And one of the benefits of, you know, this digital format, one of the silver lining in a way of our digital format is that we've been able to really take this day before the conference starts to focus in on um, some topics that are really important to the Societies Committee and to the AIA more generally. 
And given that so much of education and learning in our strange new world has shifted to an online format, the Society's Committee wanted to devote an hour or so to the fantastic and accessible digital initiatives that are currently being undertaken by students and scholars within the world of archaeology and classics and Near Eastern studies. Now, more than ever, there's a real need to connect with other scholars working in the field. The, as I'm sure many of you know, the AIA National Lecture Series has moved completely online, uh, which has offered a really exciting opportunity, I think, to make lectures or topics of interest accessible to uh, scholars and to AIA members more generally, even if they're not within close proximity to the actual lecture location. However, even though this move online has prompted some exciting changes, it's also made other aspects of our goals slightly more difficult. The most obvious of which is um, putting some real limitations on research and travel, but just as important, I think, are the associated benefits of in-person lectures, which help to foster conversations between students and professionals in the field uh, and offer up the opportunity for important outreach programs that render new research uh, and approaches to classical material broadly accessible to the general public. So in discussing what we wanted to highlight in this newly instituted uh, Society Sunday, the Society's Committee wanted to bring attention to the important work that is being done by a number of digital humanities projects in the field, each of which strives to address issues of accessibility, outreach, and presenting new research. And today we'll hear from three projects, Digital Hammurabi, Everyday Orientalism, and Peopling the past. Together, their exciting work offers new paths by which scholarship can be conducted, research shared, and connections fostered within this really vibrant community. In terms of structure, just a few brief words on that. Uh, so in today's panel, we'll hear a summary of each project's uh, goals and efforts. These will last each about 10 minutes, and I'll introduce each project just before they speak. Any questions that you might have should be submitted through the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen on Zoom. And then once all the speakers have finished, I'll open up the floor to questions and I'll read out the questions that you have submitted. So without further ado, uh, let's begin. I'm really excited to start this off. So beginning our panel today is the team from Digital Hammurabi, which is a public outreach and digital humanities project that aims to provide reliable, accurate information about the ancient Near East and surrounding areas in an entertaining and engaging fashion. So the team consists of Megan Lewis and Dr. Joshua Bowen. And joining us today is Megan Lewis. So she has a BA from Birmingham University uh, in the UK in ancient history, as well as an MPhil from um, the same uh, in Assyriology and an MA in Near Eastern Studies from the Johns Hopkins University. She was ABD in a PhD program at the Johns Hopkins University before deciding that her energies would be better spent elsewhere, although she does hope to return uh, to Hopkins to finish up her doctorate uh, at a later date. She serves on the board of directors for the nonprofit Humans Against Poor Scholarship, and she takes care of the day-to-day -day running of the Digital Hammurabi YouTube channel and podcast. So with that, I'll turn it over to Megan. Thank you so much for that. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this panel. Uh, Joshua was supposed to join us also, uh, but I got the time zone conversion wrong. Uh, so he unfortunately can't make it. You've just got me today. Um, you've kind of heard about our uh, academic credentials. I'm going to say we're not really what you'd probably consider traditional academics. Uh, neither Josh or I have a teaching or a research position at a college or university, and we most likely never will. Um, but we believe that the work we're doing through Digital Hammurabi to bring good academic scholarship to interested non-specialists is actually really important. Um, and I have to say, since starting Digital Hammurabi, I feel more a part of the field of Near Eastern Studies, I think, than I ever did um, as a student. So this has been a really exciting time for me, and uh, I'm really happy to be able to talk about what we're doing. 
Um, so we started Digital Hammurabi in April 2018, when I was halfway through writing my PhD dissertation. Um, and Joshua had just about recently graduated with his own PhD uh, for a variety of personal reasons, uh, moving across the country or across the world so that he could take a postdoctoral research position just wasn't viable for us. So we were looking for an alternative way to keep Josh engaged in the field um, and kind of to, to use the education that we have both been blessed to receive. Public outreach seemed like a really good way to do this, especially given the relative paucity of publicly accessible Assyriological content. I always say that everyone knows about the pyramids in ancient Egypt, but very few people can tell you what a ziggurat is or point to Mesopotamia on a map. Um, Digital Hammurabi was originally intended just as a side project, really something to keep us both engaged when a traditional career wasn't possible. Um, but interest and engagement within the YouTube community really established Digital Hammurabi as a dedicated platform for public engagement really very quickly. Um, so we now not only have our main YouTube channel, we have a secondary channel called Anna Mesopotamia, which produces um, videos intended for middle school students. Uh, we also are very active on Twitter. We run two podcasts and we occasionally blog when we have time. Um, we primarily focus on the ancient Near East, so ancient Iraq, Syria, the Levantine coast, as well as Egypt and the Hebrew Bible. While the majority of our material is produced by myself and Josh, we're also slowly involving other students and early career researchers in the projects. Uh, for example, we have a video series called Assyriology Today that highlights new developments in the fields, and that's written and presented uh, by E.L. Mazaros and Sarah Moore, who are two PhD students from Brown University. Um, and collaborating with them has really been a joy. Um, and I'm hoping as things grow and develop to get more people involved in what we're doing. Manage, uh, managing Digital Hammurabi is now essentially my job. Uh, we produce a very wide range of videos, including language classes, readings of ancient literature, uh, and explanations of things like biblical criticism and the decipherment of cuneiform. We also regularly schedule interviews with academics. These are students, professors, independent researchers, to talk about their own research and to give our audience the opportunity to ask questions and to engage with real life experts. Um, one of the things that can be quite difficult to do without any kind of um, graduate training is work out where to get good information from. So by putting actual professors and doctors in front of an audience, we're trying to help foster that engagement. Um, we release those interviews both on our YouTube channel and as episodes of our podcast. So we have a digital Hammurabi podcast. Um, and the Hebane podcast, which focuses on the intersection of the Hebrew Bible and the ancient Near East. We also publish, self-publish, reliable evidence-based general interest books through the Digital Hammurabi Press. And we're in the process of creating an online journal aimed again at a general non-specialist audience. Uh, we also provided live streaming services for the At The Margins conference held at Brown University in 2019. And we're going to be live streaming 2021's Ancient Near Eastern Graduate Conference also. Um, Digital Hammurabi is currently working in conjunction with a new nonprofit, the Save Ancient Studies Alliance, to produce a virtual conference this coming August aimed primarily at marginalized scholars um, and those who haven't followed the traditional academic career path. And really everything we do is geared towards putting good research in front of uh, an interested non-specialist audience, in front of lay people who cannot access this material easily by themselves. So to say that we've been blown away by the level of interest we've received is really something of an understatement. Um, we're still small in terms of YouTube channels, but we do have over 20,000 subscribers um, and we gain approximately 700 new subscribers on a monthly basis. Um, for a concrete illustration on exactly how popular some, some of this very esoteric material can be, uh, we can look at uh, Josh's, um, the first in Josh's Learn to Read Ancient Sumerian video series. This video is consistently the most viewed video on the entire channel. Um, it's been viewed over 85,000 times since we uploaded it in May 2018, which is nearly twice as many times as the second most viewed video, which has only had 48,000 views since September 2018 also. 
As a direct result of the popularity of this video series, last year we self-published an introductory Sumerian grammar, which is aimed specifically at people with no training in ancient languages, and is designed really to be a workbook that you can go through by yourself without having a university professor there effectively teaching you the, the material. Uh, and since December 2019, when we launched that, we've sold a total of 1,462 copies through Amazon. And I, I actually cannot overemphasize how shocking this is to both of us. Um, I was expecting maybe a few hundred in the first couple of months, but sales just keep going up. Um, we sell an average of 120 copies a month, um, and I have currently got uh, friends, acquaintances working on translations of French, German, and Arabic. Uh, so we can really widen our reach with that one. Um, and Josh is also working on an intermediate Sumerian grammar as a sequel, uh, hopefully to be published sometime this year. The success of Digital Hammurabi allowed us to create a PhD scholarship, which you heard a little bit about at the beginning, which we call the Humans Against Poor Scholarship Grant. Um, it's an entirely crowdfunded summer scholarship uh, of currently $2,000 uh, for PhD students. Um, and one of the driving forces behind founding this grant was to give students more exposure to the idea and practice of public outreach. So the interview process is specifically designed to give them experience in talking about their research to non-specialists. Um, the interview process means that candidates have to participate in a short live interview, um, during which time they can both explain their own research, but also then take audience questions, uh, which again kind of helps foster that relationship between specialists and non-specialists. Um, we don't have any stipulations on how the grant money is used, so students can use it to pay rent, buy food, um, pay travel costs for conferences or for, for research visits, just generally continue living while they carry out their summer research. And due to the generosity of our fan base, we managed to offer three grants for both 2019 and 2020. Um, HAPS has experienced a similar surprising growth to Digital Hammurabi. We've gone from a very informal system of donations to a federally recognized nonprofit. We received our nonprofit status in March, which was very exciting. Um, we started off with just four sub uh, supporters in July 2018, but we currently have over 50 regular donors who contribute a total of $634 a month. Uh, we have people also who send in irregular donations, $10 here and there when they can afford it. Um, and even with a global pandemic that's making finances uncertain really for everyone, HAPS hasn't seen a significant drop in its income. And we were able this summer to add a second funding opportunity, the Black Scholars Matter Initiative, which is designed to help Black undergraduates attend professional conferences uh, and connect them with mentors to help them establish a network, hopefully making it a little bit easier for them to really get started on a career in, in ancient studies. Again, it's still a relatively small organization, but I do feel that HAP's sustained growth shows that the public are not only interested in the research being carried out in these fields, but they see enough value in it that they're willing to contribute their own money to support it. So how can you guys use what we do? There are a few ways. Uh, obviously, if you're looking for something informative and engaging to watch or listen to, we have a very wide selection of interviews and edited videos that may be of interest to you. Uh, no prior knowledge or understanding of a particular topic is required. You should be able to just hit the play button and enjoy yourself. If you teach in any capacity, then you could consider assigning some of our material to your students. While we primarily make content for the enthusiastic layperson, our emphasis to sticking to evidence-based academic research with plenty of citations means that our videos are an excellent way to deliver introductory information to students in the classroom, especially now when so much learning is being done virtually, both at high school and college levels. We also have a small number of videos, as I mentioned earlier, aimed at middle school children, which can be found on our secondary channel, Anna Mesopotamia. And in addition to that, if you have students who want more experience with public outreach, please do encourage them to consider either arranging an interview with us or some kind of other collaborative work, um, either as part of the HAPS program or just through Digital Hammurabi. Um, we'd also be really thrilled to collaborate on any public outreach program that you may be toying with, but aren't very sure how to get off the ground. We've uh, learned from our mistakes, so I'm very happy to make sure that you don't make the same mistakes as well. Um, and that is actually all for us. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Well, thank you so much, Megan. That was fantastic. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, uh, if you have questions for 
Megan and the Digital Hammurabi Project, um, please enter them below on the Q&A uh, tab, and then we'll get to all the questions uh, at the end. So we'll now move on to Everyday Orientalism, which is a platform for discussing and challenging the ways in which Western history and power have shaped people's views of the Middle East and other non-Western cultures. The team includes Dr. Catherine Blouin, Dr. Usama Aligad, and Dr. Rachel Mares, who unfortunately could not join us today. Catherine Blouin is an associate professor in classics at the University of Toronto. Her work centers on the socioeconomic and environmental history of Roman Egypt, and her research interests include the Nile Delta, multiculturalism, cultural identities, as well as environments, peoples, and periods that are commonly considered to be marginal. She has also worked on the cataloging, restoration, and digitization of the Greek papyrus collection in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, and on the addition of Greek documents on papyri, leather, and ostraca from that collection, as well as the Franco-Italian mission on Teptunis. She's very busy, <laughs> She's very active in the field. Her current research explores the ways in which imperialism, settler colonialism, and orientalism have impacted and are indeed still affecting the fields of classics, papyrology, and Egyptology. And of course, she is a co-founder and co-editor of the blog Everyday Orientalism. Joining her today is Usama Ali Gad, who is a tenured lecturer and assistant professor of papyrology and Greco-Roman studies at Ain Shams University in Cairo, Egypt. And he is also a former visiting fellow at the Institute of Classical Studies at the British Academy. He has a doctor of philology in papyrology, uh, sorry, a doctor of philosophy in papyrology from Heidelberg University in Germany, an MA and a BA in classical European civilization, which is classics, uh, from Ein Shams University, and a BA in English language and literature, and a B.Ed. in teaching English as a foreign language from the Faculty of Education of Al Menofia University in Egypt. So without further ado, I will also turn it over to both of you. Thank you so much. So thank you very much for having us today. I will just start and um, in the coming 10 minutes, you will hear from uh, me and my friend Catherine about the three main topics, um, the genesis of this project, the types of the courses that we uh, have and we create and the workshops and the talk series, uh, which has contributed widely to uh, everyday Orientalism. Um, I will just introduce this talk and then leave the stage to my friend Catherine to give you a much more detailed uh, idea about this project and the type of our posters. Um, so um, Everyday Orientalism is uh, a digital humanities uh, project with um, an international standard serial number, which means it's citable and uh, you will hear more from Catherine at the end. So Everyday Orientalism um, is, uh, at least to me, a project that started in 2014 when I uh, began my blog, uh, The Greco-Roman Legacy uh, in Egypt, which was also called Classics in Arabic. So back then when I was studying in Heidelberg, I have uh, tried to challenge uh, Eurocentrism and um, Orientalism that is prevailing in the field. Uh, you could have a look at this uh, blog, but we concentrate today on Orientalism. Um, and uh, to make uh, my uh, story short, um, in 2015, I was invited in an international conference organized by Francisca Nita and Monica Berti under the auspices of the Alexander von Humboldt um, Chair of Digital Humanities. And I presented a paper about Eurocentrism and Orientalism and papyrology and, and how the, uh, the future, the digital humanities um, challenges and chances could improve uh, this and uh, give us a, a wider idea, a good idea about this. So Francesca posted this on Facebook and we did have a quiet audience. And in 2016, I met Rachel and Catherine in the international uh, conference of papyrology and we decided that we have to take a step uh, forward and start this uh, everyday uh, orientalism and we have a great paper called Inside Out. So 
uh, we have this um, published on everyday rentalism and uh, you could uh, uh, go to see all this uh, in the blog and um, uh, Catherine has done a great deal of work on analyzing the anonymous review that we received. Our paper was success, but it does not meet the review standards of the Congress. So Catherine has done a lot of work and you can um, look at her work. And I have to say that um, uh, Catherine is the most active one of the three of us. And I think now uh, I can turn to her in order to continue and tell us more about uh, this project. To you, Catherine. Thank you, Sama. Hi, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be uh, with you all today. Can you, can you hear me? Can you do a thumbs up? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so I just want to say a few words about the general aim of, uh, of this project and this journey really uh, between uh, the three of us and everyone who's been participating and then highlight some of the general types of posts and initiatives that, that have unfolded over the past four years. So. So this is really a, kind of an intuitive project that we started as three friends who really felt like um, there was a need in terms of conversations related to antiquity in general and other related academic disciplines, a need for a, a space for conversations that are beyond the canon, beyond traditional boundaries of all sorts uh, to, to, to find a welcoming home. Um, and so we were, the three of us at a stage in our career where we could take that risk because we had permanent positions. So we thought, okay, let's, let's do it. Um, it's been really an intuitive journey. So we really didn't have any plan uh, from the start. We don't have a regular calendar. We don't have any funding and we didn't have any particular we didn't have any particular audience in mind, I guess. We were writing for our peers, people inside the field students. And also we were hoping that it would eventually also be of interest to people outside uh, of, of, of the field. Um, so, so far we've published 81 um, posts and uh, they can be grouped in a few main categories just to give you an idea. So by far the most popular posts uh, so far uh, are those related to pedagogy. And this is something we found as we went along. So we have a whole variety of posts by the three of us, but also by a series of uh, generous guest uh, bloggers. Um, I should say guest bloggers who go from undergraduate students to more established scholars. And um, so we're hoping, oh, sorry. Are you still seeing my... Uh, are you still seeing my uh, my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. That's okay. Yeah. There was an Adobe update that <laughs> showed up. Okay. Um, yeah. So we have a series of pedagogical posts um, that um, seem to be of great interest to a lot of our peers and students as well. Um, several posts that uh, propose analyses or reflections that pertain to antiquity related disciplines, but also other fields, especially anthropology. Um, so there's a whole a variety uh, of them as well. Uh, we have several pieces that um, can be considered to be about reception. Uh, these include several posts by Rachel Mayers, uh, which are directly tied to her pedagogical, but also research work, as well as interviews. So we have one with Feroz Vazunia, uh, another two-part interview with Pierre Briand. And more recently, we published a great piece by a uh, PhD student, Eduardo Garcia Molina on trauma classics. And Cuba, so you see it goes in all sorts of directions. Um, some essays as well on, once again, a variety of topics uh, that go from uh, decolonizing Canadian literature to uh, the reception by a Singaporean a scholar of crazy rich Asian to Canadian mining and settler colonialism. Lastly, uh, a few posts pertain to what we could call kind of scholarly activist positioning and also outreach. Um, so whether we're talking about public facing patrology, uh, issues related to um, indigenous rights in North America, um, the climate change or uh, the work of female scholars in the field of ancient history. Uh, 
So if any of you is watching uh, right now uh, is inspired to you know, contribute to the blog, please reach out to us. We are, uh, we are always interested to feature uh, different perspectives and different uh, ancient and also contemporary voices. Um, a last word on our other endeavors. Uh, we started in 2017 a yearly workshop uh, set in Egypt. Uh, called Orientalism, the Classics in Egypt. So the aim is really to foster conversations between Egyptian and Arab speaking scholars, as well as uh, scholars from Europe and settler colonies. Um, and the program is really meant to be 50-50. So, so far we've had three, um, three of those workshops in Cairo, Alexandria, and, um, and Alexandria. And the last one was supposed to take place last spring, but it's been uh, postponed until uh, everyone is vaccinated. Um, but now the postponement uh, of this uh, last workshop was somehow a silver lining because this is how um, the series of Everyday Orientalism talks, EO talks, uh, came into being. So once again, it was really an intuitive uh, project which started with a couple of talks and then it kind of grew. Some people reached out to us. We got other ideas. And uh, we ended up hosting uh, 15 talks over the past um, summer and fall. And the great thing about that is I think it's allowed us to create some wonderful pedagogical content, thanks to the generosity of everyone who's been um, participating and sharing their knowledge uh, and work with us. So that's it for our project. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And again, just another reminder, please submit your questions if you have them now, um, and we'll be able to get to all of them at the end. Uh, so our last project is Peopling the Past, which is a new collaborative digital humanities initiative launched very recently. Uh, we launched in <laughs> fall 2020, so we're definitely not as established as uh, the other two projects that you heard about already. And it's run by a team of Canadian archaeologists, historians, and art historians specializing in the cultures of the ancient Mediterranean and Middle East. The goal of this initiative is to produce and host open access multimedia resources for teaching and learning about real people in the ancient world and the real people who study them. The team of six women include myself, uh, but also doctors Chelsea A.M. Gardner, Christine Johnson, Megan Daniels, Melissa F uh, Funky, and Sabrina Higgins. And speaking on behalf of uh, our group is Dr. Christine Johnston. Um, and she is currently an assistant professor of ancient Mediterranean history at Western Washington University. She earned her PhD from the Kotzen Institute of Archaeology at the U University of California, Los Angeles, with a focus on the archaeology of Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, and the Near East. She currently works on a field project in Western Cyprus, but has also excavated in Israel and Turkey, as well as in Vancouver, Canada. Her research centers on the cultures and history of the ancient Mediterranean world, particularly on economic exchange and cross-cultural interaction. She employs historical, anthropological, and network methodology to examine political economy and exchange systems in the Eastern Mediterranean, particularly the roles of non-institutional actors and extra-palatial trade networks. So I will turn it over now to Christy. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to the Societies Committee for organizing this. And it is a great pleasure to be speaking to you all, in particular with some panelists of projects that I am personally a very big fan of and use in my classroom. So it's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as Carolyn mentioned, we are a little bit the new kid on the block. So we are still <laughs> really new to this uh, experience, but we're really excited to be here and talking to you. So as Carolyn mentioned, Peopling the Past is a multimedia digital humanities initiative. We produce and host free open access resources for teaching and learning, in particularly focusing on real people in the ancient world and the real people that study them. And again, as Carolyn mentioned, we are a collaboration of six Canadian women. We all met 
in some capacity at the University of British Columbia as undergraduate or graduate students or faculty. And we have a variety of different specialties from archeology span and history to philology uh, and in different cultures around the Mediterranean. But I think what really brought us together was both sort of an extensive background in digital humanities in our own research and our own work, but also a strong commitment to public history. And so this grew out of the move to online learning that we're all still largely navigating. Uh, personally, for me, I had, had the experience to participate in the Skype a Scientist program, which I really enjoyed. And as we were all moving around May, early May, to this online teaching and watching all of this labor being extended to producing materials and finding materials, we thought it would make sense to come together and start this project. So there really are two primary project goals. So we produce content that aims to move past the quote unquote big history. So these grand narratives, great men, warfare and, and political trajectory. So moving past this big history, as well as beyond the dominant historical perspective. So who gets to tell history and what voices are prioritized. So with this work, we hope to challenge the narrow stereotypes of both who gets to tell the history of the ancient world and whose stories we choose to tell. So as mentioned, we are multimedia. We produce a variety of deliverables in the form of a blog, and that is primarily thematic. Uh, so we have series for a variety of topics, and I'll give you a little more information on these in a second. We also just launched our first uh, student profile blog. So this is again highlighting an up and coming junior scholar, graduate student, and the innovative work that they're doing. We have a podcast and Carolyn the Ferrier is one of the hosts along with Chelsea Gardner of our podcast. Uh, season one focused on the archaeology and art of Greece and season two uh, in development now will focus on Rome. And then we produce videos and that's my role with the project. What I've shown you here is a screen grab of our website where we have, in addition to the uh, launch or the release of this media, we have our image of the month this was from December showing a tablet discussing preparations for the Saturnalia and a variety of other resources for other digital projects like Everyday Orientalism and Digital Hammurabi. So all of our content to echo what has been sort of stated with our earlier speakers focuses at a really a general audience. So it's accessible to anybody with limited background in the study of the ancient world. Uh, all our content is accessible, so it is open access at resources like YouTube, Spotify, and iTunes. All of our material is shared with a Creative Commons share alike copyright, which means it can be shared uh, in classrooms, on other blogs, and other spaces. And all of our material itself is accessible in the form of transcripts and captioning. Uh, we also supplement our posts, supplement our media with additional resources. So readings, other media on the internet, other videos, and other websites. So just to give you a little sense of the types of content we produce, uh, here are a couple of the blog posts that we launched in the fall. So since we launched in September 2020, we've had nine blog posts, uh, 10 videos, and 12 podcast episodes released. So on the left, we have one of our uh, thematic posts from our series on Halloween. This was on serial killers. We also had posts on cursed tablets and Celtic monsters, as well as human sacrifice. And then on the right, from one of our project members, Sabrina Higgins, uh, at Christmas time, a post on the nativity scene and imagery. We will have upcoming series this year uh, in April for Earth Day, so focusing on human environmental interactions, as well as a series coming up on sort of quote unquote unknown peoples, so cultures that often get marginalized or placed at the periphery of cultures like Greece or Rome that gain a lot of attention in the study of the ancient Mediterranean. We also have our podcast and I've shown images here of the release of episode 10, which focused on Greek, uh, the art of aging in Greek art. And in this case, uh, we have both the blog post that gives 
a little background, a little synopsis of the episode and biography of the speaker, as well as additional learning resources produced by the speaker and some supplemental images to illustrate the discussion. So as you can see here, some really excellent examples of aging in Greek statuary. And the podcast brings together experts of a variety of background, from professors to archaeologists, art historians, uh, curators at museums, and scientists. So bringing together all different perspectives on the study of the ancient world. If you want to learn more about this podcast, our podcast hosts, Carolyn Leferriere and Chelsea Gardner, will be speaking in AIA sec session 7F, which is Friday morning. It's the sustainable and inclusive archaeological practices from field to public session. So if you want to learn more about their experience hosting season one of this podcast, you can find them there. And my role with the project is to produce the videos. So all of our videos are short, around eight 12 minutes, some extend a little beyond to 14, 15, and they're all structured around the same three questions. So they're really easy to follow for non-specialist audiences. And again, they focus on highlighting aspects of ancient history that are harder to find in our historical mainstream textbooks and looking at the types of data you need to tell these stories. So the first question is what topic you're talking about. The second, what sources or data do you look at? And then the third, how can this topic or material tell us about real people in the past? So again, breaking down for our audience exactly how we research and tell stories of those that are often marginalized in our main sources. And like the podcast, all of our videos are released with an accompanying post that includes a synopsis, a biography of the speaker, as well as additional resources. So this was a post for Rebecca Fudo Kennedy's video on uh, migrant women in the Greek world. And we have a variety of resources by Dr. Kennedy. She's very prolific as well in public history. So there was a variety to draw on. And then at the bottom of the post, we include additional resources, which is really helpful in say classrooms. So additional reading on the topics uh, at hand, as well as online resources, again, to make this as accessible as possible for people who may not have uh, sort of university access behind paywalls. And to give you a sense of the variety of topics, our first 10 videos released focused on all sorts of aspects of life from the production of craftspeople in cook pots and uh, Egyptian coffins to aspects of daily life like Roman mime and theatrical performance as sorry my dog wanted to join me as well as again focus on those who maybe don't meet or aren't prioritized in our mainstream histories. So for instance, the experience of people with disabilities in the Greek world, as well as a strong focus on women. So again, migrant women in Greece, uh, agency of female devotees of the cult of St. Thecla, or the worship of Isis, in which we had Catherine Vlen, our other, <laughs> our other panelist participating. So in terms of how this can be useful for our societies, uh, it can meet a lot of the same needs that we originally started focusing on with the teaching environment, so in the classroom. And so this material can be used as a supplement. So as we heard in the introduction, the AIA has a really strong national lecture program, and this can be a great supplement to those lectures. So providing some resources that focus on junior scholars and their maybe innovative perspectives or methodologies in dealing with some of the content they may be highlighted by our more established scholars in that lecture series. Uh, it can also be used for discussion groups. And I know I've experienced uh, this type of discussion group with our local Vancouver RC chapter as well, where we bring together different material, different resources uh, for discussion groups with society members. So I've given you a few examples here. You could focus on women and say textile production and use episode three of our podcast with Catherine Harrington and combine that with a video like Rebecca Fudo Kennedy's video on uh, migrant women in the Greek world. You can combine our resources with some of the resources of our other panelists. So for example, Catherine Boulin's video of the cult of Isis with the everyday Orientalism talk nine of uh, the goddess Isis with uh, Solange Ashby. 
if you wanted to extend the conversation in more general to the history of Nubia, you could incorporate some of Digital Hammurabi's recent uh, interview with Aaron D'Souza. And you can also combine this with some of the other resources that are available digitally online. So for example, that podcast episode I mentioned uh, of Greek art of aging with Susan Matheson could be combined, for instance, with a Google tour of the British Museum or of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. So with all of these materials, as well as the sort of corpus that is growing online of digitally available uh, open access materials, I think there's a great opportunity to really enliven some of these conversations within our societies as well. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm really grateful to all of our panelists for joining us today uh, and to for introducing us to their projects. So I think we'll jump right into uh, the questions. So the, I'll just start at the beginning. So from uh, Fotini Condili, uh, for peopling the past, what season will late antiquity or Byzantium be featured? We have many people interested in joining you. Um, Chris, Christy, go ahead. Well, I, I feel almost this is one you should field, Carolyn, as a podcast. I, I think if it's in terms of the podcast, uh, it's definitely slated as a future season. Uh, we're going to get through Roman art and archaeology next. Um, and then we'll, it's definitely on our radar, though. Uh, so please do be in touch if you have recommendations of speakers or if you yourself are interested uh, in speaking with us. Um, Christy, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think we have a couple of videos that do deal with, say, uh, into later antiquity in Egypt, that video I mentioned of Sabrina Higgins and the cult of St. Thecla. So there is some content that is getting a little bit later in antiquity, but I think, as Carolyn mentioned, that may be one of the more upcoming seasons of the podcast. So a question from Martha Payne for uh, Megan. Does the Digital Hammurabi Project have a connection with the Oriental Institute in Chicago? No, no, we're affiliated with just us. <laughs> And I actually have another question for you since you're already unmuted uh, from Heron Ellenson. Uh, what are some of the most important lessons you learned that can be shared to increase outreach by all archaeology educational initiatives? I think the biggest thing for us, especially when we were just starting out, was collaborating with other people um, and exposure from people who are already established, especially on YouTube. Um, we had a really like warm welcome into the YouTube community. Um, we were invited on other people's channels to talk about what it is we do so that their audience could then come and become our audience. Um, so that kind of publicity really is invaluable. If this is something you're interested in, like getting started, then I, I think reach out to me, reach out, I suspect to everyone else here, do guest blog posts, go on their podcasts, really publicize your own work. Um, because that's the the quickest way to grow and to to gain your own audience, um, and it's it's also a I think really important part of this whole digital outreach community is really networking and, and building a really um, strong community that that works together, and we all complement each other in in very different uh, ways. So I think that's for me really important. Thank you. Uh, so this is a question for everyday Orientalism from Larissa Shipley. So uh, she says, I was wondering if you could provide your thoughts on potential name changes involving the term Orientalism and how removing the term may help to move beyond its attached biases and assumptions. One example that comes to mind is ASOR's name change from the American Schools of Oriental Research to the American Society of Overseas Research. Well, I'm Usama, are you okay if I start? Yeah. The whole point of the name is to critically engage with Orientalism. So maybe this is something we didn't make clear enough in the, in the presentation. So thank you for your question. As Usama explained, um, the project really was born of us being sick and tired of Eurocentric positionings and uh, orthodoxies within our respective fields and of this everyday Orientalism that we saw in scholarly practices in a lot of pedagogical practices, uh, despite claims to us having moved uh, into the 21st century. So it's really um, 
about engaging critically with Orientalist perspective, but let's say we use the term Orientalism in, in a broader way than, um, than Said did. So it becomes about processes of othering and of stereotyping of particular groups that are exoticized and um, portrayed in, in ways that, that, that are um, embedded within a colonial or imperial uh, dynamics. So I would say that we're not, we're not thinking of changing the name because this is really what we're trying to deconstruct. So it's a very different use of the term than, than assorts. Thank you. Uh, so this is really a question for everyone from Solange Ashby saying, I can't help but notice that so much of this work is being done by women scholars. Any thoughts on why that might be? Multitasking. <laughs> for me, it's directly linked to our family situation. Um, because of the, uh, the way our family works, I, I have to stepdaughters and we share custody with Josh's ex-wife. So like uprooting and just taking them across the country uh, for postdoctoral work is, is just not going to happen. Um, and on top of that, I found it incredibly difficult when I was a student to be a full-time parent and a full-time student, um, which is one of the reasons why I, I ended up uh, leaving the PhD program. It was doing my mental health absolutely no good to try and kind of cram everything in, um, especially because we're, we're Josh has a full-time job that financially supports us. So I had to be home. Um, so for me, this kind of like outside the box work and research is really the only way I can keep myself active and I can maintain relevancy in a field that I really love. Does anyone else have any thoughts <laughs> on this? Maybe Christy, you're a good one to answer since we're six women <laughs> who have put together this project. I think it's an excellent question. It makes me think a lot as well about uh, gender discrepancies in things like uh, the labor and department service, uh, that there is a very gendered breakdown there. I, it's a really tough one and I think it does speak a little bit as well to what Megan was saying. I happen to be somebody without children, but members of my community, uh, other women in my sort of academic world do. And I was watching a lot of them really struggle with this move to teaching online while also somehow parenting full-time online, which is just mind blowing to me. Uh, and so I was watching a lot of this labor and a lot of a lot of scholars, female scholars, spending their time guest lecturing in the classrooms of their colleagues and thinking of ways to be more efficient and thinking about ways that we could try and capitalize on the labor that was going into this in a way that would reduce the ongoing needs. And so I think I'm not going to make any claims about whether or not there is a gendered sort of awareness there of those experiences, but certainly for me, it was seeing a lot of the struggles of my colleagues and, and how they were trying to navigate this shift and trying to find ways to, to counteract that. And this is, a, this is a phenomenon that goes beyond our three initiatives, right? You think of Adolon, uh, the work of Rebecca, Kuto Kennedy, Sarah Bond, mm -hmm. many others, right? The female, it's true that female are heavily, um, there's a new, uh, there, there's a new uh, podcast as well um, not a podcast, a new blog also by um, also a female a PhD student, uh, Nadira, who started that recently. Um, so I, I, I will not aim at the general response, but this is really striking. This is absolutely striking. And, and may I add something, you know, which could be, I have read it before that, uh, you know, this patriarchy of the academia, you know, there is something um, going on the academia itself. I mean, not virtually. So I'm, I'm not a woman, but again, I can't see this around me. Maybe I am in Egypt does not have this because uh, we have a very good balance in my department. Maybe some of you have, but again, it has to do with what we do in um, reality and, um, how, how the voices that are heard there 
and the voices and the spaces that are giving to us online, which otherwise we we don't have this chance. At least I will speak about uh, myself as someone who may be seen as an outsider to the Western academia. So that's that's also one one thing to, to one thing to think about when we see all these great initiatives. I have to say, you know, which don't maybe. Uh, don't have uh, a voice in other venues. Well, thank you everyone for your uh, comments. It's such an important topic. Um, and I'm really glad that we had the chance to speak about it because um, just speaking as a member of People in the Past, it's something that we've discussed a lot um, as we've been developing this project. Uh, so we have time for one more question. Um, before we have to wrap up. So I'll keep it to be a, a really um, quick one. Um, and it was for Digital Hammurabi. Um, just trying to find it, sorry. But it was about uh, when some of the um, grants and uh, when, when the grants would open and, um, and how how that process works. Sure. Uh, so you can check the the uh, HAPS website, which is www.hapsfund.com. Um, that has all of the information. There's a particular area for um, applications. Um, applications for the summer grant will be opening late February, early March. Um, and it's a I, I think they're pretty straightforward application processes. Um, but I send an email around the Agade listserv. I post it on Twitter. It goes on YouTube. If you want a personal notification, email me, digitalhammurabi at gmail.com, and I will just send you an email and say, hi, we're accepting applications now. Um, the Black Scholars Matter is a little bit more tricky um, because it relies so heavily on a physical conference for students to attend uh, for networking purposes. Um, the board of directors has actually decided to essentially suspend awarding those a grant. We haven't started awarding them because it's so new, um, but not to award them until RC and ASOR are back in physical conference form. Um, so it's kind of a watch this space uh, thing. Um, hope, hopefully soon. Uh, but all of the information will be on the website and again, we'll put um, notifications out on Agade um, and the Egypt Egyptological Listserv as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions, but uh, I'm sure just speaking on behalf of our panelists, if you reach out to them, I'm sure they are more than happy to continue answering some of your questions by email. Um, and just a reminder for society officers, we have our happy hour starting uh, in two minutes. So, and that is a separate Zoom link uh, for those who are joining us today. So thank you again so much to our panelists. This has been a really um, you know, wonderful and informative hour that we've been able to spend with you and we wish you the best of luck uh, with your projects. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you again to our panelists and um, I hope you have a great few days during this conference. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for organizing. I just want to say thank you guys for presenting before I run off to host the happy hour. That was it was really wonderful. And um, I'm so excited to continue using all of your material uh, <laughs> in our classes. And, and hopefully we can all collaborate on, on something. <laughs> Yeah, I really like what Kristen said about, you know, building these modules and I'm really, you know, it's syllabus season. So I think the timing of the panel was good as well. So hopefully yeah. we'll do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. And I'm so glad I got to share the, you know, the screen with all of you. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was fantastic. You all take care. You, you too. too. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone.